So you and a few people in the squadron either detected UFOs on your instruments or saw them directly. Tell me the full story of these UFO sightings and uh, to the smallest technical details, because I love those. <laughs> I'll do my best. So we returned from, and when I say we, I mean, my not my squadron, but VFA-11, the Red Rippers. Uh, I was a, a somewhat junior pilot at the time. I joined them on deployment in 2012, where they had been already out there for about six months or so, um, operating in the vicinity of Afghanistan. Uh, I joined them and then we we flew back and still as a, a relatively new guy, we came back and we entered uh, what's considered a maintenance phase where we slow down the tactical flying a bit, uh, kind of recuperate, do some maintenance on the aircraft. And our particular model of the F-18, the lot, the lot number uh, was plumbed uh, for the particular things that were needed to upgrade the radar from what's known as the ABG-73 to the ABG-79. And the APG-73 is a mechanically uh, scanned array radar. Uh, it's a, you know, perfectly fine radar, but the AESA radar is kind of a, you know, magnitude jump in capability, kind of a, an analog digital kind of mindset. So, Got it, so it's a leap to digital. Um, APG-73, so I mean, are these things on a carrier? Like, what are we talking about here? This is How our- How big is the radar? Yeah, so this is actually the radar, it's in the F-18 itself. Okay, so when you say they were chosen, this is to test uh, the upgrade to the new, the 79, ABG 79. Less of a uh, test and more of just, hey, it's your turn to get the upgrade. Like we're all going to these better radars. Um, they were building ones off the off the line with the new radar, but we were this weird transitionary squadron in the middle that transitioned from the older ones to the new ones. But it's not particularly rare to fly with different types of radar because in the, and we call the fleet replacement squadron, essentially the training ground for the F-18, you have all sorts of F-18s with different radars. So um, you are used to having multiple ones, but in the actual deployable co combat squadron, um, we upgraded. And when we upgraded, we saw that there were objects on the radar that we were seeing the next day in, in this, with this new radar that weren't there with the old radar. And these were sometimes, you know, the same day, you might go on two flights, the one in the morning might be with the older radar, the one in the evening with the new radar. And, you, and you'd see the objects with the, with the new radar. And that's not overly surprising in some sense. Uh, they are more sensitive. Uh, perhaps they're not filtering out everything they should be yet, or perhaps there's some other type of error. Uh, maybe it needs to be calibrated, whatever. It, it was relatively new and we were somewhat used to there being software problems with these types of things occasionally, just like anything else. And so, okay, maybe this is a, a radar software malfunction. We're getting some false tracks, as we call them. Um, what were you seeing? And so what we would see are representations of the object. So this is off of our radar. We're not seeing a visual image here. This is kind of like a what's being displayed to us almost like in a gaming fashion, right? Like our, the icon, right? So the icon is showing us, that, hey, something is there. And here's the parameters I can understand about it. So this is in the cockpit. There's a display that's showing... Um, some visualization what the radar is detecting. Correct. And there's two different ways to do that. The first one is like the actual data, like the, the radar where um, I am, it's showing me the data kind of as if it's in front of me and I'm selecting those contacts. And there's another screen called the situational awareness page. And that's kind of a God's eye view that brings all that data into one spot. And so uh, I'm going to talk about this from the SA page, from the situational awareness page versus the individual radar ones because it's easier. But Can you, so, sorry, sorry to linger on that. So the individual displays are like first person, and then the SA is when you say God's eye view, it's like from the top, the integration of all that information as if it's looking down onto the earth. Yes. Is that a good way to summarize it? It is. No? But for the aviator, it's slightly different because those two radar displays I talked about are at the bottom of that display is kind of representative of where I am. And so I see Got what's it. in front of me. Got it. Whereas the situational awareness page, uh, the aircraft is located in the center of that. And then I, all around me, you know, based off of the data link and wherever I'm getting information from, uh, I can see that whole awareness page. I can see all the situation. So um, I'm gonna kind of talk about this from the situational awareness page, which is a top-down view, mm -hmm. just to kind of frame our minds instead of jumping around. And so what we would see out there is we'd see these indications that something would be there and they would have a track file. That track file, that thing that represents the object has a line coming out of it. And that represents, 
that's called the target aspect indicator. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's some tracking from the radar. Correct, so it's showing you where the object's going. This is all pretty cool that the radar can do all this. So radar locks in on d different objects and it tracks them over time. Correct. That's coming from the radar. That's like built-in feature. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. It's out there, we're seeing it. And so we don't have to necessarily like pull things into our our tracker in some sense, right? Like it's all out there and then we can kind of choose to highlight on stuff or to kind of focus in on it more so. Uh, but the information should all be out there. And so we'd see the, that target aspect indicator, that that line, on a typical aircraft, you know, it would kind of look like this. It would be coming out and it would go steady. And if they turn, you, you know, it would be like, boop, 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 and you see them turn, right? Like it's not magic. But this object, they would, the target aspect would kind of be like all over the place, like kind of randomly in the 360 degrees, you know, from that top down view, mm -hmm. that line would be in any place. So kind of, you know, is it unable to determine the, tar the target aspect? Is it stationary, you know, and that's just how it puts it out and it's not used to seeing it. So I'm not saying that's necessarily super weird, but it was different than what we were used to seeing because we weren't used to seeing stationary objects out there very much. Um, and what was also interesting is that these weren't just stationary on a zero wind day, right? These are stationary at 20,000 feet, 15,000 feet, 500 feet, you know, with, with the wind blowing, you know? <laughs> And so much like the sea, you know, when we're up there fighting, it affects everything. We consider the wind when we're, you know, shooting missiles, when we're flying or fuel considerations, it's like operating, you know, in that volume of air, like the ocean, everything's going with the current. And so anything that doesn't go with the current, you know, is immediately kind of identifiable and strange. And that's why these were initially strange is because they would be stationary against the wind. So if you had something like a good drone in a windy conditions, what would that look like? Would it, it would it not come off as stationary? Would it sort of float about kind of thing? No, I think with the drone technology we have today, they could stay within a pretty tight location. Well, I meant like DJI drone, not like, I'm saying like generically speaking. I would not, even, not, not a military drone. No, I, just, I have a DJI drone myself even, and you know, maybe not a hundred knots, but if that thing's in 30 or 40 knot winds, you know, the amount of distance it's going to be kind of doing one of these, like that change is not yeah. something I'm gonna detect from maybe many miles away. Interesting. Um, so it could look very stationary, uh, but that wasn't necessarily, you know, and what's interesting about this story is that there's not like the one smoking gun, right? You have to kind of look at everything. And that's what you know I don't like about um, the Department of Defense and just generally people's take on this is that everything is kind of based around a single image, you know, or that, that one case, but a lot of the interestingness comes from the duration or the time it's been out there, how they're interacting relative to other objects out there. And you don't get that information when you just look at a frame for a second, you know, everyone kind of bites off on the shiny object, but. So you yourself, from your particular slice of things you've experienced and seen directly or ind indirectly, you've kind of built up an intuition about what of the things that were being seen. I wouldn't go that far. I've just been able to, you know, eliminate some some variables because of how long I've observed it. So like you said, yes, can a drone stay in a particular position against the wind like that? Certainly, but I don't think it can do that and then go 0.8 Mach for four hours after that, you know? And so when you when you look at it outside of that one, that moment in time, then it eliminates a lot of the potential things it could be, at least from my perspective. So what kind of stuff did you see? Yeah. In the instruments. We'd see them flying um, in patterns, uh, kind of racetrack patterns or circular patterns, or just going kind of straight east. Um, I occasionally see them supersonic, 1.1, 1.2 Mach, but typically 0.6 to 0.8 Mach, just for extremely extended periods of time, you know, essentially all the time. <laughs> and this is airspace where there's not supposed to be anything else at all. Um, and it's Pretty far out there. It starts 10 miles off the coast, goes like 300 miles. Can you say the location that we're talking about? Off the coast of Virginia Beach. Got it. And so nobody is supposed to be out there. It's possible for people to be there. It's not necessarily restricted, but it's well monitored and we're out there every day, all day. And so, you know, people know to stay clear. If a Cessna goes bumbling in there, everyone's going to know about it. FA is going to, you know, call them out, going to tell us about it. So, um, Incursions happen, not a big deal, but um, it, they're pretty rare, honestly, because everyone knows the area and we've been operating there for decades. And what are the trajectories at 0.6 to 0.8 Mach that these objects were taking? Typically, they would be in some type of circular pattern or kind of racetrack pattern when they were at those speeds, or I just see them kind of, and it wasn't always like a mechanical flight description. And when I say that, I mean like an autopilot is going to be just very precise, right? It's gonna be locked on straight, 
And whereas I could see an airplane, I could tell if the pilot's flying it, right? Because it's not going to be perfect. Hmm. The computer's not controlling it. And these seemed more like that. Not that they were imprecise, but that they were even much more erratic than that. So like, it wasn't like a straight line in a turn. It was just kind of like a, you know, a weird drift like that in that direction, you know? So it wasn't controlled by a dumb computer or uh, not, not disrespected computers. <laughs> so it wasn't controlled by autopilot kind of technology. That's not the sense that I got. Yeah. 